Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here this evening for the sake of hearing you speak unto us and teach us the doctrine in the book of Job, chapter 16. Lord, we pray that as we begin of uh, this session, Lord, we will be guided by you and that you shall help me as your servant, Lord, to preach this word faithfully guided by the Holy Spirit of God and that your children shall receive the thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Answered and said, I have heard many such things, miserable comforters are we all. Such vain words have an end, or what emboldens thee that thou answerest? I also could speak as you do, if your soul were in my soul's stead. I, I could heap up words against you, and shake my head at you, but I would strengthen you with my mouth, and the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. Though I speak, my grief is not assuaged, and though I forbear, what am I eased? Now he hath made me weary. Thou hast made desolate all my company. Thou hast filled me with wrinkles, which is a weakness against me, and my leanness rises up in me. And my leanness rising up in me beareth witness to my face. He teareth me in his wrath, who hated me, who hated me. He garnished upon me with his teeth. My enemies sharpened his eyes upon me. They have gaped upon me with their mouth. They have sweetened me upon the cheek reproachfully. They have gathered themselves together against me. God has delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. He has also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. His archers compass me, compass me round about. He cleaveth my reins asunder, but that does not spare. He poured out my girl and upon the ground. He breaketh me with, with breach upon breach. He rather the hold me like a giant. I have sold sackcloth upon my skin and defiled my horn in the dust. My face is foul with weeping, and on my eyelids is the shadow of death. Not for any justice in my hands, also my prayer is pure. O earth, cover not thou my blood, and let my cry have no place. Also now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and my, and my, record, and my record is on high. My friends scorn me, and my eye poureth out tears unto God. All that one might plead for a man with God is a man pleading for his neighbor. When a, when a few years are come, then I shall go the way whence I shall not return. Amen. Amen. Um, Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16. We still continue with the study of the book of Job, and I pray that you are... Uh, being edified out of these teachings as a child of God. And today we are looking at Job chapter 15. Uh, last time when we were looking at Job chapter 15, today we are looking at 16. Last time when we were looking at 15, we saw uh, that uh, there is a friend uh, to Job known as Eliphaz who, is, who, who responded back unto him after Job had uh, spoken, uh, showing them how they lack wisdom, showing how they are not good men unto him. And Job insisting that he had not committed any wickedness. And uh, Job also uh, proving unto them that he is not inferior unto them. Then Elphaz takes up to respond back to Job by showing Job that also he does not have wisdom. In fact, he goes even further telling Job that his words are the ones or the words of his mouth expose him and that he has no wisdom, he has rejected the wisdom of the old and so on and so on and so on. But in chapter 16, Job responds immediately to the words of Eliphaz and look at verses 1. The Bible says, Then Job answered and said, 
I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. So Job is just responding back to Eliphaz's word and telling him, all the things that you are telling me are not new unto me. I have heard all, you know, and I know them, but you should know that you are a miserable uh, comforters, all of you. He is not talking about Eliphaz alone, but referring to the three friends. He is calling them miserable comforters. Look at verse 3. He says, Shall they words have an end? Or what embolded thee that thou answerest me? Uh, that thou answerest. So the reason why Job is calling these three friends miserable comforters is because they heap words against Job. Their work is just to heap words against Job, vain words. And Job is asking them, where are you getting all this boldness to accuse me and to answer me even in my time of trouble? Why are you not even passionate unto me? Remember he said earlier that a good friend is one who has, you know, pity upon your troubles. The one that sees you suffering and have some pity. Therefore, Job comes to a point where he concludes them as miserable comforters. So when Job is seeing them, he is not seeing comforters that will restore him or give him hope. He is seeing people that will make him as a miserable guy. Look at verses 4. Job says, I also could speak as you do if your soul were in my soul state. So what Job is telling them is that you are miserable guys, you are miserable uh, 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 comforters, but I wish you were in my, in my soul state. I wish you were wearing the shoe that I am wearing now. And so that you could feel the way I'm feeling if I chose to speak the way you people are speaking unto me now. The one thing we should see out of this is that Job is telling them, you do not understand what I am going through. You do not understand the shoe that I am putting on. You was just to heap, you know, uh, words against me, heap words that are not of any hope unto me. But if I were like you and you were like me, I should have also just spoken unto you the way you are speaking unto me. And if you go down to verses 5, we'll come back to uh, verses 4. Job says, but I would strengthen you with my mouth and the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. So Job is telling his friends, if I was in a real situation like you and you were in my real situation, meaning if you people were sick as I am, you would have lost everything that I, I have lost. If I came over unto you, I, would have, I should not speak the way you people have spoken unto me. But one thing I would have done is to strengthen you with the words of my mouth so that I can take away the sorrow that you have or, you know, give you hope and make you see that there is hope, you know, at the end of this. And so he is asking them, if you are in my situation, if you are putting on a shoe that I am putting on now, and then I come over and I begin to speak unto you the way you people are speaking unto me. How would you feel it? How would you feel it if you are speaking unto me the way you are speaking unto me and I have lost my marriage? How would you feel? How would you feel if you are the one who has lost your employment and then I come over and begin to speak unto you the way you are speaking unto me without considering the pain you are experiencing, without consider, considering the sufferings that you are going through, how would you feel? But he challenges them by telling them, if it was me having you in your situation, like my situation, I will strengthen you with the words of my mouth. I believe that this should teach us something, that unless you know what somebody is going through, don't be so quick to heap words against him. Amen. Amen. Unless you know what somebody is going through with regards to marriage problems, with regards to poverty, with regards to lack of money, with regards to 
any trouble in this life, don't be so quick to heap words against such a, a friend because you really don't know the pain he is going through. And you know, we have this tendency of heaping words against our friends that are suffering when we know that on our sides we are feeling well. For example, times can come when you, you, know, you, 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 you hear that Pastor Paul is not able to pay his house rent. And maybe you are able to pay your house rent. So instead of you finding words that will assuage my sorrow and give me hope, you would rather just come over and tell me, Pastor, you know you are a lazy man. You know, such a statement will not encourage me. And by so saying, it simply means you are not putting on my show to understand the pain that I am going through. So you don't want to be like the friends of Job, who Job is saying, they are a miserable comforters because they are just telling in vain words. They are not feeling the pain he is feeling. Their work is just to throw words unto him. But Job is challenging him or challenging them by telling them, if this was your situation, I would have spoken unto you words that will calm your sorrow and take away your grief. I want you to go down to verses 9. I want to expound much on the point of these guys heaping words against him when he really needed them to uh, encourage him. He says in verses 4, I also could speak as you do if your soul were in my soul step. I could heap up words against you and shake my head unto you. So simply what he's trying to tell us here or show us here is that these people are just, you know, throwing words unto him, shaking their head against him, telling him anything. Because if you consider from chapter 1 up to this place, you know very well whether it be Elphaz, whether it be Bildad or Zophar, what they tell Job is just meant to break him down. In fact, they are telling Job, if you are a righteous man, if you are a perfect man, you should be increasing, you should not be going down. You should be living long a healthy person. You should be here to see the children of your children. But now because you are a, a wicked man, you have committed wickedness against God, and you are not willing to come open and you know uh, confess your sin, that is why you are suffering. Look down to verses 9. In the same chapter, Job cries against his friends. So he cries, number one, saying, you are just heaping words against me. But verses 9, he continues to say, He teareth me in his wrath who hated me. He gnashed upon me with his teeth. My enemy sharpened his eyes upon me. So what he is saying is that even when they look at him directly, they have no mercy upon him. They have no, you know, this uh, uh, feeling. And you know, because you know, there are ways through which Somebody can look at you and you can tell whether he, he or she is sympathizing with you or is mocking you or is laughing at you. There are different ways of communication. Besides just speaking, you might notice that he is quiet or she is quiet, but the eyes can tell you that this person is not sympathizing with me. So Job is crying saying, my enemies, who are called his friends, my enemies have torn me down in, the, in, in his wrath. And you know, they hate him and they are gnashing upon, you know, upon him with their teeth and their eyes are just sharpened against him. Look at verse 10. It says, they have grabbed upon me with their mouth. They have smitten me upon the cheek reproachfully. They have gathered themselves together against me. This is a man that is beaten. This is a man that is troubled. And he is complaining against his friends. If you would go to Psalms 22. He is complaining against his friends. His friends are vain, uh, miserable comforters. His friends are not telling him anything that will take away his grief. His friends are making him a miserable guy. And at the end of the day, he is complaining against them. He says that instead of comforting him, they have smitten him. 
reproachfully, meaning that they have just make, made him feel ashamed. They have gathered themselves. These three men, it's like they just planned to go and, you know, fight against Job through their words, through what they do against Job. Psalms 22, we can see again David speaking of the same. He says, verse 6, But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me love me to scorn. They shoot up the lip, they shake the head, saying, It rested on the Lord that you deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him. Go to chapter 35 of Psalms. So, Job called his friend, his friends his enemies. In Psalms, David is also speaking about his enemies who have also shaken their head against him and they shoot their lips against him, meaning they are speaking unto him Words of no grace, words of no mercy, they are words that are meant just to break him down and to leave him a hopeless man. And this is the word. Let us see if God will deliver him out of that problem. He, he, makes, he calls himself saved. He calls himself a saved guy. He every day goes to church. Let us see if God will deliver him. You know, you don't want to hear such a statement coming from the mouth or the lips of your friend. You don't want to hear that. But this is exactly what these guys are telling Job. They are telling Job, you are a wicked man. God cannot come and secure out of this problem unless you confess that you are a sinner. You have committed wickedness. Psalms 35, 11. Psalms 35, 11. Bible says, False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. And my prayer returned unto my own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourned for his mother. But in my adversity they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yeah. The objects gathered themselves together against me. And I knew it not. They did tear me. Mark that. They did tear me and cease not. With hypocritical mockers in feast, they gnash upon me with their teeth. The same words that Job is speaking concerning his friends. You know, Job is telling his friends, if it were you that was in my situation, I would have comforted you. I would have spoken words that will take away your grief. But instead what you are doing unto me as my friend is to tear me down. Is to make me look a miserable guy. And David here is saying, that when his so-called friends were in trouble, he behaved as if though it was his own problem. He was there to help them. He made himself, you know, somebody that is really caring. He prayed for them. He said, when they were sick, my clothing was circular. Meaning that when these people were sick, he was always praying for them. He was always crying on their behalf. He was always there caring. He was always there, even for going to an extent of fasting, denying himself, just leave it, denying himself what he really, you know, thought, if I do this, it will be the best sacrifice given unto my friends. But he says, when it was my turn, when I became sick, when I fall sick, when I lost my marriage, when I lost my job, when I, you know, Problems knocked my door. When I lost my parents, the same people that I helped, the same people that I fasted for, the same people that I prayed for, what did they do instead? They rejoiced. They were not happy for me. They gathered themselves together against me. 
You know, he says, they did tear me down. They were not here to comfort me, but only to tear me down, only to put me down. And David says, with hypocritical mockers in face, they gnash upon me with their teeth. Amen. I want you to go back to Job chapter 16. So if you compare scripture with scripture, you can see that the Bible is very true to itself. That soon you will experience such friends. They are in this world. When you are so good unto them, you cannot even tell if they will ever give you their back. You can never tell whether they will tear you down. You can never tell whether if they will give words unto you. In fact, when you are helping them, they will only say thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. You are a good friend. But when your turn will come, you need to be so much careful because when you call them, they will not receive your call. When you write a message unto them, they will not write back. When you please call them, they will not pick that call or even make you know, a point of calling you back to ask you, is there any problem? You know, and that is how human beings behave. But we should not be as human beings behave. We should know that we are the children of God. And we should be like Job who says, if this was your problem and I was, you know, healthy and it was me to come, to come and see you in your problem, I will not heap words against you, but I will encourage you. I will make sure that I am taking grief away from you. I will not come here to tell you that you are a wicked man. I will not come here to tell you that you deserve to suffer, to suffer this punishment. Look down to verses 5 where we, we read before. In, in Job chapter 16. He says, but I will strengthen you with my mouth. This Job uh, challenging them. And the moving of my lips should assuage you are great. The same thing that David said in verses uh, 13 of Psalms 35 that when they were in trouble I was there for them. When they were sick I was praying and fasting for them. I was busy visiting them in the hostel. I was busy taking them water to drink. I was even busy trying to see that as much as I cannot help with the great help, but I am there to just help this person reach where he can reach. My question unto you is that in times of trouble, will you become a miserable comforter like John, like 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 Elphaz, like Bildad, like Zophar? Or will you desire to become like David, who says when they were in trouble, I was there for them. When they were sick, I was there for them. I denied myself a best meal just to make sure that they are okay. I fasted. I behaved as if though it is my own mother who got sick. You know, there are times when brethren will give in and, you know, support you as if it is their own mother. Oh God sick. Yet you are not the mother. You are not the relative. But because of Christ's love, because of the God we serve, saints have to bend low just to make sure that you are comfortable and you are well taken care of. Look down to uh, chapter 16 verses 6. So when you become a miserable comforter, the product is not good. The product which is given or which the person that is troubled or suffering gets out of your miserable comfort unto him is worse. Because he says in verse 6, though I speak, my grief is not as well. Job is saying, even though I'm speaking unto you guys, because of you being miserable comforters, because of you speaking against me, 
because of you la laughing and mocking me instead of remembering that when you had trouble I was there for you because of your mockery my grief is not taken away he says and though I forbear what am I is says verse 7 but now he has made me weary and has made me desolate all my company he says because of this miserable comfort because of these people that would just come over and heap words against him and you know accuse him falsely and call him a wicked man instead of them sympathizing with him because he has lost children the wife is very far from him his good health is taken away his good properties are taken away he says these guys here have just come over to make me even more weary Look at verses 8. It says, And thou hast filled me with the wrinkles. When we speak about wrinkles, are those lines that come on the face. You know, with people that have gone through life troubles and situations, not because they are old, they are very young, but because of life difficulties, because of the challenges of life, if you look at them, unto them you, you, you might end up thinking that they are 60 years old. Yet when you ask them, they tell you, I am just 30 years old. But because of trouble. Job is saying, because of their miserable comfort, because of who they are, because they are staying here long, they are not encouraging me, they are not praying for me, they are not fasting for me, but they are just heaping words, sharp words against me. They have filled me with wrinkles, which is a witness against me. And my leanness rising up in, in me beareth witness to my face. You know, I want to give you my life experience because the things that I'm, we, we see in the Word of God, sometimes they have happened in our life, will not be as serious as to Job's case, but at least you can, even you, I'm sure maybe you can remember of a tough situation whereby you waited long for those friends and they did not come. You waited long for that phone call and it did not come in. I mean, have you never found yourself in a situation whereby you thought you had friends? Every time you keep on checking on your phone, any missed call, nothing. Any message, nothing. Any please call me, nothing. And you wonder, is my phone having any problem? Only to realize that those you thought are friends are no longer there for you. They went away. You know, when I lost my daughter, because I lost my daughter, the one that Becky should be following, people came in our home as comforters. They came in our home as comforters. By that time, my wife was in the hostel. She had gone through CS. She couldn't even do anything. I was alone, you know, uh, doing the burial and all that. And people came. You know, within a few minutes, people were crawling in the in the home. And you know, like our lawyer society does, and you know, I hate the culture of lawyers, I don't know about other tribes, but I hate the culture of lawyers when it comes to issues of funeral. Because what they normally do is, they'll come in the name of mourning, they'll come in the name of crying, but that is not the case. Some come there just to eat and leave you empty-handed. So when they came over, they came and, you know, my mother was busy running up and down, killing chicken, killing, you know, you know, making sure that the visitors that have come in are doing what? Are eating. Some were, you know, sitting under the, you know, the, the, the sheds. Others were in my house. Others were in the house of my, my, my dad. And they were busy eating rice. They are eating meat. And, you know, that is what they are doing. That is what they are doing. The only comfort they were able to give me, if I remember, are some women, women who came over and told me, don't cry. Men don't cry. Don't cry because of a child. Men don't cry. That was the comfort. You know, they will, they will make sure that whenever they come for that funeral, they slash down every resource. They, in fact, if you don't give them food, they will leave complaining. 
Have you not heard them, if you are a lawyer, have you not heard them saying, that funeral was not good? And if you ask them, why was it not good? They will tell you there was no food. There was no meat. There was no enough so and so. But look here. After that, what happens? You know, it was unto my shock to realize that the same people that came in the name of mourning for the loss of my daughter are the same people within two weeks, three weeks, I heard them speak against me. I heard them speak saying, I am the one responsible for the death of my child. I heard them speak saying that I have things that eat up my children. That is why I lost this baby again. Brothers, you don't want to have such people around you. You better be alone. You better face your situation alone rather than being around people that are called comforters. But the truth is they are miserable comforters. You don't want anyone to come close unto you in the name of a comforter. Then after that, you realize that he just came to check on you whether you are suffering well the way it's expected or not. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. My point is that we are not only speaking about them. Keep note of that. We are not only speaking about them, the comforters, but we are also speaking about you. Are you a miserable comforter? And maybe you might tell me, no, I am not a miserable comforter. Whenever I go in the house of mourning or wherever I go and visit the sick, I always make sure that my words assuage their grief. My words give them calm. But look, then if you are not a miserable comforter, my question is that do you even take that, you know, that step of visiting the, them that are troubled? Because what you see for Bildad, Zofa, and Elphas is that they did not remain in their houses. When they got the news, they said, no, let's go and see Job. And the Bible is very clear that as they were coming, they saw Job from afar, and they even forgot that this is Job. Because Job was stricken. Nobody would remember Job, even by image. But you know what they did? They came all the way from the house to come and see Job. Who they purport is their friend. Unfortunately, they turn out to be miserable comforters. You that he's saying is not a miserable comforter. Do you even take a step of going forward and visit the troubled brother or sister? Do you even take your phone and say, hey, let me call. I am very far, I can't make it now. Let me call, let me check on him, let me check on her. I have not spoken for, uh, unto him, uh, to him two days past. Let me now even inquire and see how he's faring on. Or you are just that type of, you don't care. It is none of your business, provided it's not your problem. That is very bad. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verses 2. The Bible says, it is better to go to the house of mourning, meaning the house of sorrow, than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. So the Bible says, we have our house of feasting, a house of celebration, and a house of mourning. A house of mourning is where people are crying, is where people are sorrowing. It's like going to Kenyatta Hostel, or Mama Lucy, or going to a morgue somewhere, or going to where there is a funeral. That is called a house of mourning because the business there is that people are crying, people are mourning. And here we have a house of feasting, a place whereby people are celebrating their birthdays, a place whereby people are celebrating their you know, graduations, people are celebrating how they have succeeded in life. Where will you choose to go? That is what the Bible is asking you. Here you have a sister that has lost the father, the mother, the brother, the sister. And here you have also a brother in the church who is having a wedding ceremony. 
Where will you go? A majority of us will choose to go where people are celebrating, eating and drinking and never go to that house of mourning. The Bible says it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting for that is the end of all men and the living will lay to his heart. Verses 3 Sorrow is better than laughter for by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. Verses 4 The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning but the heart of fools is in the house of mouth. You know, I don't want our church and our church family to get into this category of fools. A category of fools is where when someone has a, a problem or a challenge, it, like, it, it appears like nobody is even aware of that. Even when Pastor Paul continues to say, Brother so and so has this problem. Brother so and so has lost a brother. Brother so and so has lost a sister. Sister so and so is sick. Brother so and so child is sick. It appears like nobody is even hearing what Pastor Paul is saying. That to us should be, we are fools. Because the Bible says, if you are wise, when you hear that, you know that that is where I need to rush. That is where I need to go because when you are there, you will understand that this is the end of every man. We don't want to be like other cults outside there. For example, the Orwarians. You know, the Orwarians believe one thing. That if in any case you lose a relative, your relative who is not an warrior? They will not come to that funeral by this statement of saying, let the dead bury their yeah. dead. Imagine how foolish you can be by twisting the scripture because of validating your bad behavior, of not visiting the houses of people that are mourning. When this scripture says, let the dead bury their dead, it is not even applicable as to how the Orients believe and many other people. You know what? If you lose your mother, who is not a member of this church, and maybe she is not even saved, it is our responsibility to come and stand with you. We will not say that, oh, she is not saved, she was not saved, she is not part of us, therefore we will not even care. No! If we do that, we become false. Brothers, you might ask me, Pastor Paul, what is your point? This is my point. This family, the family of faithful Lord Christ Baptist Church, should be a family of wise people. That when problem strikes, it has stricken all of us. It is the moment when you need to wake up and call. It is the moment... For example, if a problem, you know, knocks the door of your brother or sister in the Lord and it is 11 p.m. or 10 p.m., you don't sleep. You don't say, I don't care, I'll check on him, on, you know, or her in the morning. You try to make sure that you are being a person of help. If you can't go, supply the means that can help this guy to go to the hospital rather than just being there alone and saying, Provided it is not my sister, provided it is not my brother, I don't care. So it is easy for you to say, I am not like Bildad, I am not like Zophar, I am not like Eliphaz, because these three guys are miserable comforters. They just wasted job and made him more weary. But to you that is not a miserable comforter, what do you do? How better are you than Bildad, Zophar, and Elphaz if you never make even a point of just going into that house and mourn with them and cry with them and stand with them and comfort them and tell them what the Bible says. Because when people are grieved, they come to a point of where if they even forget what the promises of God is. So they want you to remind them. They want you to be a support there for them. They want you to be there to sing with them and pray with them. It is not about Pastor Paul alone. It is not my work. It is ours all. 
You should not have this mentality of saying, if a problem occurs unto me, Pastor Paul will come. But if it occurs to another brother, Pastor Paul will go. It is not our job. No! When I come to your house to check on you, I am not coming as a pastor. I am coming as Brother Paul. I am coming as your brother in the Lord. Amen? So I think the point is driven and the point is at home. And the reason why I'm saying this is something that I have noticed amongst ourselves. That when it is about a brother or a sister in a problem, people don't care. People give it a dead ear. People give it as a blind eye. People don't want to ask. People don't want to call. People don't want to care. They are just waiting to hear someone say, ah, we went through that problem and now we are through. Ah, now you wait for on Sunday when they come and you begin to say, I heard that you had a problem. What are you doing? You heard, then what would you do? Don't you know that your time will come? Look, Job is telling his three friends, if it was you, I would have done the opposite of what you have done unto me. Meaning that, Life is a turn. If it is you today, it is me tomorrow. tomorrow. If I lose my relative today, expect that for you tomorrow. So we need to understand and be wise and make sure that we walk as wise people and not fools. Go back to Job 16. Job 16 verses 11, Job continues to cry and to lament against his friends. He says, God has delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he has broken me asunder. He has also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. So this is the word of Job or the words of Job with regards of what is happening around him. You remember, in our previous chapter, uh, studies, we saw that God is the potter and we are the clay. And anything can happen unto us by the permission of God. So Job is simply saying, even though you guys have failed in your comfort towards me, even though you guys are heaping words against me, even though you guys are not praying for me, are not fasting for me, are not encouraging me, but you are looking at me as a wicked man who has committed wickedness, but one thing I know is that it is God who is causing me to go through these things. He says I was at ease, I was just okay, I was well, but he has broken me asunder. He has taken me by my neck, he has shaken me to pieces and set me up for his man. Verse 13. His archers compass me around about. He cleaveth my reins asunder, and does not spare. He poureth out my gall upon the ground. He breaketh me with bridge upon bridge. He runneth upon me like a giant. He's saying that God has decided to walk on me. God has decided to pull me. God has decided to break me in pieces. These are men who does not understand that there was a conversation between Satan and God. But like any other human being, there is this point when in life you come and say, God, I leave everything for you. God, I know that this is happening at your will. You know very well what I am going through. God, I know you have allowed me to go through all this trouble. And then he says, verse 15, I have sold sackcloth upon my skin and defied my horn in the dust. My face is full with weeping and on my eyelids is the shadow of death. That God has put me in this situation. God has subjected me in this situation. He has broken me into pieces. He has taken me by neck. He has set up a mark. His, uh, 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 he has set me um, uh, up for his mark. He has, you know, broken me asunder. But unto me, as the one that is going all through these problems, 
Mary needs to cry. Mary needs to weep. I mean, he's saying, my morning, my afternoon, my evening, my night is just filled, filled with tears. Nothing else. I have nothing to rejoice in. And on my eyelids, it's just the shadow of death. Meaning, I am at the point of dying. That is how how far God has brought me. Look at verse 17. He says, Not for any injustice in my heart. Also my prayer is pure. He's saying, I know that I am going through this. I know it is God taking me through this. I know that I am suffering. I know that God has allowed you wicked people to come and speak against me, to heap words against me, not because I have committed any wickedness, because even my prayer is pure. You know what he means by saying that? He has not charged God foolishly, neither did he cast God. So he says, even when I'm praying, my prayer is pure unto him. I leave everything for him. He has chosen to do what he wants to do with my life. I am not blaming him. I am just expressing my situation in his hands that it has pleased him to break me into pieces. Not because of my wickedness. Not because I have committed sin. Not because I have, you know, uh, oppressed the poor. Not because I have done anything. Because even also my prayer is pure. I am not praying unto him as a wicked man. He says in verse 18, O earth, cover not thou my blood, and let my cry have no place. Also now behold, my witness is in heaven, and my record is on high. If you ever come to a point and say, God is my witness, that is the point when your friends are against you. That is the point when your friends are insisting on your sin, which you have not committed. Until you reach to a point of saying, okay, say whatever you want, do whatever you want. My witness is in hell. He knows if I did it all. <clears throat> this is where Job is come now. He says, you know, you are heaping words against me. You are calling me a wicked man. You are falsely accusing me. But one thing I know, I am suffering not because of any injustices, not because I am a wicked man. My prayer is pure. And one thing I know, God is my witness. And my record is on high. It says in verse 20, My friends scorn me, but my eye poured out tears unto God. They are busy mocking me. They are busy you know, uh, uh, speaking against me. They are busy accusing me falsely. They are calling me the names they wish to call me. Others are speaking against me, gnashing their teeth, tearing me down. But I will pour my tears unto God. God will look at my tears and have mercy upon me. <coughs> Says verse 21, All that one might plead for a man with God, as a man pleaded for his neighbor, when a few years are come, then I shall go to way, to go the way when I shall not return. So he says, he wishes that there was a human being that could come and plead on his behalf unto God. He wishes that there was a human being that would come and pray unto God because of his situation. Because these three men are not praying. These three men are not fasting on his behalf. These three men are adding pain unto him. He says, I wish there was a man who can plead for a man with God. I wish there was one that can cry for my children unto God. The same way a man pleaded to a man on behalf of his neighbor. He has nobody to stand in, in the gap. He has nobody to intercede for him. He has nobody even who can go in the secret place and say, God, I am praying for my brother Job. God, I am here to cry for my brother Job. God, I am here to cry for your masses because of my brother Job. No, they are just saying you are a wicked man. You have committed wickedness. You don't have anything to say. Your mouth is witnessing against you. And Job says, when a few years are come, then I shall go the way where I shall not return. 
He says, I still have only a short time. And after that, I will go back where I came from. And I will not come back. Simply saying, I am just close to my grave. I have no hope of saying that I am here for many years. With my situation, unless God intervenes, my years are very few. I am going where I came from. And once I am gone there, I shall not return. Hope you guys remember the doctrine on issues of death. And when we spoke about once you go into your house, your final house, the grave, you don't come back. Job is also reminding us here that once you go there, you don't come back. Brothers, I need to go today back in your house asking yourselves these questions. Which kind of a friend are you? Which kind of a comforter are you? Are you waiting for that opportunity where your brother or sister is in trouble and then you choose to go silent? You choose to go and hide? Or are you the one who is planning to go there but what you are going to cause there is more trouble and make that brother or sister become more weary? Do you have some sympathy in your heart? Do you have some mercy in your heart? Are you the guy of you know, are you the guy or a brother or sister who says, I want to be a helpful person to brother so and so during this trouble? And you know, when I'm speaking about days, I'm not speaking about death alone. I'm speaking about our day to day life in Nairobi. It's very difficult, it's very hard. I tell you the truth, it is very hard. But you know what? Even if it is very hard, if we were all good friends, if we were all good comforters, those problems that we experience every day will not appear as a mountain unto us. How much does it just cost you to buy someone a meal for one day? How much? I mean, how, how much will it just cost you to buy someone a one-day meal, or even a single meal in a day, just 50 bob, 100 bob, you struggle so much. Or are you waiting until that time when funeral will come up? That's now when you say, now I want to be a comforter. No. If you really care, and if you are really part of this family of God in this church, you should know one thing. People are going through a lot of trouble. People are going through a lot of problems. The problem is you have distanced yourself. The problem is you don't care. But the moment you begin caring, you realize that you have a lot of opportunities to be a good comfort. You have this great opportunity of providing tea. You have this great opportunity of providing sugar. You have this great opportunity of providing hope. You have this great opportunity of visiting. But now the problem is that you want to be an island. You want to be alone. You don't care. You are not there for anyone. Save for your child, your mother, your sister, and all that. Let me tell you, that should not be our mentality. We should change our reasoning. We should go back home knowing that the book of Job is here to teach us. If you think that salvation has no problems, as, as in like after you get saved, there's no problems. Here we have a man of God, upright, suffering. And through these sufferings, we can see the kind of friends we can encounter in this life. And therefore we should take caution. I don't want to be a miserable comforter. I want to be there as a help. I want to be there as a support system. I want to be there as a prayerful person on your behalf. I want to be there to just to, to keep you company. What about you? A sister or a brother can miss out of this church even for three months. And it's like for others, they don't care. But if you really care, you'll be concerned. Maybe that person was knocked down by the car. He's in the hostel. Who knows? Maybe he lost everything. Who knows? Let us be the true friend the Bible teaches.
teaches us. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for your word this evening. I pray that you help us be good friends and comfort us even unto our friends who go through different problems and challenges of life. Lord, they have been broken down. Lord, please help us never to end up like a builder, Elphaz, and Zophar, people that really make job become more weary and never be encouraged. Give us wisdom even as a church family and to have this culture of really caring about our brothers and sisters in the Lord even more than ourselves. Father, help us to overcome this behavior of selfishness and caring more about ourselves more than our brothers and sisters and teach us to love one another according to your will and grace. As we go back to our houses, Lord, we pray that we are guided by you and blessed by you and protected by you until when we come back here on Friday again to see what happens with Job in his words to his friends. Lord, we bless your name and pray that every church member shall be blessed too by your name, O oh God. And as even we prepare for baptism on Sunday, Lord, I pray that you prepare the children for that. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Song number 417, more about Jesus. More about Jesus will I know. <clears throat> 